Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's roundtable. Why choose a Caribbean medical school as presented by the American University of Antigua College of Medicine. This series of live streamed roundtables feature our very own alumni who will talk to you about their path and their success. My name is Par Prem Kumar, and I'm the advisor to the president for special projects at AUA. Tonight's discussion, why choose a Caribbean medical school, is very resounding as each year thousands of qualified medical school applicants are not accepted into the US medical schools. But why should that shatter the dreams of becoming a physician? It shouldn't. And it's all about knowing your options. Enter the Caribbean medical schools. While not all are created the same, we like to think that we are the best of the best. There are equal opportunities to study at an accredited university receiving top quality education and the chance to fulfill one's dreams of practicing in the United States. Today, we would like to break the stigma of Caribbean medical schools and highlight a few of our star alumni who have gone on to being successful, having made their made for medicine journey through a Caribbean medical school, the American University of Antigua. We are very excited to introduce you to our alumni, but before we get started, just a little reminder housekeeping. If you have any questions for the alumni during the presentation, please type them into the comments and I'll bring them up during the presentation as well as the question and answer session at the end. Now let's meet our panelists. First is our 2012 American University of Antigua grad, Dr. Sri Shivaraman, one of AUA's Canadian students. Dr. Shivaraman is currently practicing as a vascular surgeon at Parkview Medical Center in Pueblo, Colorado. Did I get that right, Sri Pueblo? Yeah, Pueblo. Pueblo, okay. Yeah. I'm Indian. <laughs> <laughs> So Dr. Shivaraman, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey. Uh, so to recap, I am Canadian. Uh, I'm uh, from a town right outside Toronto or a city called Mississauga. It's about, it's the sixth largest city in Canada. Uh, I went to undergrad at the University of Western Ontario, which is in a town called London, Ontario. Uh, I found AUA in my last year of my double major in medical science and psychology. Uh, I had taken the MCAT, I had uh, applied to Canadian schools, um, and I was unable to get in. And uh, after doing my homework, I applied to AUA, uh, and I was successful. So as Par said, I graduated in 2012. Uh, I did my general surgery residency at the University of Maryland and Shock Trauma Center. Uh, I went on to Wayne State to uh, do a fellowship in vascular surgery. And now I've been practicing for almost two years here in Colorado. Fantastic. And then next up, we have Dr. Chase Parsons, a 2016 graduate from our school. Dr. Parsons is getting specialized or doing his board exams in diagnostic and interventional radiology. And he's currently practicing in Miami Beach. Dr. Parsons, please share a little bit about your experience. Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Chase Parsons. Uh, I'm from outside of Orlando, Florida originally. I did my undergraduate studies at the University of South Florida in Tampa. And you know what? I did well uh, on my basic sciences, but not quite well enough to get into an, a, a US medical school. So, you know, I kind of came to a, a dead end road there where I would, you know, had to make a tough decision. Where do I go from here? Knowing you know, my ultimate passion was to become a doctor. Uh, and luckily, through a friend of a friend, I heard about, you know, this American University of Antigua. And so that's when I decided to take my journey. Uh, and that started back in 2012. And then, you know, it seems like forever ago, but I graduated 2016. And now I'm doing a vascular and diagnostic interventional radiology in Miami, Florida at Mount Sinai. Wow. 
that's been some journey. Yes. Okay, and moving on to our next grad, 2013 grad, Dr. Jane Alukaran. Dr. Alukaran currently works at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston as a pediatric gastroenterologist. Jane, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thanks, Parr. Um, so, you know, just as uh, I'm from originally from Tampa, Florida, I did my undergrad studies at the University of South Florida, um, and I was kind of at a, a crossroads where my family was planning to move to India, and I wasn't sure what I was kind of doing. Um, I didn't do well enough to get into med school in the U.S., and so I was considering med school in India. Um, and at that time, in that inner kind of application process, you know, they kind of said, well, uh, at that time it was Kasturba Medical School. Um, and they had said, well, you know, there's Antigua that's much closer to you. Um, and that kind of opened the door um, to AUA. Um, to kind of make up, I did um, two year or two semesters of uh, pre-med um, before. Uh -huh. I did the um, four, uh, four years of med school, um, which I think really helped in kind of setting that really good basis before I started. Um, I graduated in 2013. I went on to do residency, pediatric residency at the University of Florida in Jacksonville, um, and then followed by uh, my fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology um, at the University of Texas in Houston. I've been working for almost two years um, now, and I'm working at the same um, university that I did fellowship in, and it all uh, worked out really well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, thank God somebody referred you to us. <laughs> really appreciate that. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. I know I've pulled some of you away from your clinics and uh, you know other responsibilities and uh, but I really appreciate, and all of us at AUA appreciate the time you give us, and you always answer my call and my emails, which, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I really do. Okay, so let's get into it. We do have a set of questions which has already come in earlier. I was trying to write questions, but then I was told, no, 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 we've already received these questions. So we're going to get into it. So the first step in your made-for-medicine journey uh, where to go. Um, I know you must have researched a lot of schools. I know you spoke a little bit about it, but like we said, I mean, there are, there are schools all over the place. I mean, there are schools in Poland, there are schools in the Caribbean, uh, the schools in the UK. How, how did you research it? And let me go in order. Sri, tell me from Canada, how did you manage to research uh, AUA? Uh, so just a heads up, Par is very hard. You can you can try and ignore her phone call. It's not going to happen. So I just want to let that be known. Oh um, dear. The the truth is, when it came to research, I think in 2012, AUA is still was still a fairly new school at that point. Right. And so I think that it's very well, fairly well known in the Caribbean. You have a couple top schools. So St. George is really well known. Ross is well known. Uh, I'd say AUC and SEBA and AUA would be the, the five that come to mind when you talk about Caribbean yes. med schools. And so I think at that point in time, um, Canada had limited options. I mean, I and I didn't really know anything about applying to the states. Uh, and so I had a decent MCAT score. Uh, but, you know, after I didn't get in at home, I looked for other options. Um, I saw the option in India, just like Jane did. Um, and when I had my interview originally, uh, I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew I wanted to be closer to home, which was Toronto. So uh, obviously when I got the call from AUA, that was fantastic. Uh, I think the things that stuck out were something that I hadn't heard from the other schools, which was you got clinical experience starting from your first semester. So you actually got to touch patients, be a part of patient care. Um, and I'll be honest, in undergrad and wanting to be a doctor, I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, but I knew it sounded good, and I knew I wanted to get hands-on experience. Um, and now looking back, you know, I'm a surgeon, so I'm glad I got hands-on experience early on, which was great. Um, and then I think the rest of the homework, uh, honestly, was due to helpful friends and family. Use your networks. If someone has been to our school or been to another school, ask them honestly what the pros and cons are, because 
you know, whatever we say here today, we're all happy and we have done great and we've graduated and we still maintain a great network. So I think that speaks volumes. But in the same way, use your own networks to figure out exactly where the best place for you to be is. I, I, I think you said it all, really, because this is a decision which is very personal to each, peop each person. You know, some people do well on the island, some people do terribly on the island. So, you know, it's something so personal. Chase, uh, did you did you look into accreditations or step scores or anything like that when you were looking at AUA? So yeah, one of the big things I did look into was the USMLE pass rate, uh, which obviously AUA is you know obviously one of the highest in the Caribbean, um, right up there you know with the other top three schools. Which personally, I think AUA is the best but uh, maybe I'm a little partial. Um, another thing you definitely want to look at is whether or not a school is Title IV funded, meaning you know you can receive, just like going to a U.S. government, uh, a U.S. college, you can receive U.S. government student loans, which is huge. And uh, that happened right around the time I was at AUA, so that was a big help. Um, the other big thing for me was the FIU, Florida International University affiliation. Uh, being from Florida and knowing I wanted to return to Florida, what better than to complete my two years on the island, which was an unbelievable experience. I'm sure we'll get to that. But then come back to Miami and do all of your clinical rotations at uh, U.S. Med School, FIU, uh, which is, you know, a fairly young school, but they've done a lot in, the, in a short amount of time. Um, so that was really probably the biggest things for me. I did get approached early on by one of the schools, definitely not in the, the top contending uh, schools. Right. But you have to definitely do your research. Not all Caribbean med schools are created equally, um, but AUA is definitely not one of them. They are definitely at the yeah. top. Um, and yeah, that's the, the other thing too, is that the stigma, I mean, from, from what I've seen in practice and whatnot is that the stigma of Caribbean med schools and students coming from Caribbean med students is, is fading fastly. Um, they see the work ethic, they see how great of doctors they can be and produce. And so I think that stigma is definitely fading fast. So that's good. That's super. Yes, I agree with you. I think um, uh, all of us, you know, we've seen how the stigma has been slowly, slowly, but, you know, moving away. And hospitals now actually look for students uh, who've been in the, you know, the Caribbean or, you know, off the track medical schools because maybe because you guys work a little bit harder than the others. There's no sense of, uh, you know, it's due to you to be given a position. You've got to work for that position. So, Jane, you spoke about Manipal and I know you would have done your research, uh, you know, because Manipal is one of the top, uh, you know, Indian universities. So did, when you decided to come to the UA, I'm sure your parents said, what, where, where's Antigua? So what, what, what made you change your mind? How did your parents agree to this? Yeah, um, you know, I think the whole time they were kind of like, are you sure you know what you're doing? Um, and I can't 100% say I really knew exactly all either. Right. But I knew I wanted this career path and, uh, you know, I knew I could do it if I just put my mind to it and someone would give me the opportunity. Um, so I really kind of wanted that second chance, um, you know, and ultimately it became a balance of, well, I looked at Manipal, I looked at Antigua, I looked at the other kind of um, bigger Caribbean schools. Um, and I think, you know, I knew people that had went through AUA and I think that was a big factor that I actually didn't know initially. And then as I started talking about right. it with friends and family, you know, they would say, oh, so-and-so, you know, brother went there. And um, I think being able to talk to those graduates, you know, individually and get like a really realistic idea of, you know, what the future path would entail um, kind of gave me a little bit more confidence in going, you know. Um, you know, a lot of the people that were not satisfied with their experiences, you know, had more complaints about just the general island they were on, uh, whereas like people that were in Antigua didn't typically complain about the island, you know, um, they 
always yeah, said well. how beautiful island it was. And I think there were uh, a lot of benefits that I saw from just speaking with friends and family members. Okay, yes, the networking always helps, right? For sure. And you always meet somebody. I was I was at my doctor's clinic and they had a new um, RN there. And so I was just chatting to her as I do because I talk to everybody everywhere. So, uh, you know, so I was just chatting to her and, you know, just asking her where she was from and everything. And so I told her where I was and what I did. And she said, oh, you to the American University of Antigua. And I sort of thought, oh God, what's coming? And uh, she said, my sister's son graduated from your university. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. It was a good one. You know, normally I get, oh, he got this so he got suspended. Can you do anything about it? <laughs> but this was a good one. So, you know, yeah, the networking definitely helps. You will find somebody who went to a Caribbean school who could share their experiences with you. And, you know, that's what it is. And the other factor also, and I think, you might agree with me is that I think AUA is one of the most diverse student bodies. You know, we have, we have students from all over the world, and this is something that gives people comfort as well. For sure. You know, yeah. so I think I think that matters a lot. Now, how competitive did you think it was to get into AUA? Whoever wants to go first can go first. I honestly, I think that anyone I, like from North America, I don't know about other parts of the world, but, you know, when I was an undergrad, you know, a couple of my friends and me, we were like, okay, the Caribbean is always an option. And to be honest, you're not really thinking it's a real option. You're like, I'm going to get into some school on the mainland. It's going to be great. And then when you realize, oh, wow, this, this is really happening, um, you start to look at uh, like Chase said, like the pass rates, the graduates, what are they right. doing? And then you kind of think, oh, this is really competitive and I really better speak properly on this interview and show them my best version of myself. Um, because until then, and I guess that's part of doing homework and your networking, um, I really didn't think too much about it, to be honest. I don't know if the other guys feel differently. Uh, and I wish I could say I was super prepared, but I wasn't. I was honest and about who I was and what I wanted to do. And again, like everyone, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but what that really meant, I don't think I knew so early on. So I figured out that it was competitive mainly because there are so many people in our shoes who want to be doctors, um, but don't know where they can go. Ace? Yeah, just, just to piggyback on that, um, totally agree with everything Tree said there. Um, the other thing I did fully appreciate about AUA is that, you know, they take a more holistic approach to an applicant rather than, you know, yes, you have to take the MCAT and yes, it matters. And, and in fact, it can even earn you a scholarship of a, you know, a nice sum of money. However, it's nice to have that holistic approach and look at the applicant all around I mean, what they've done between research, community service. Uh, you know, just a little bit of everything. So it's not just like they look at you as a number, they actually value you as an applicant and look at your whole application and CV. So that's good. Jane? Um, I would kind of, you know, agree with um, both of these guys. You know, I kind of initially saw it as, oh, it's probably not that competitive. Um, but then as I kind of went through it, you know, initially they had said, well, you know, they looked at my grades and everything and they saw all these other things I had done. Um, and they said, well, let's give you the opportunity to kind of prove your grades, you know? And so they gave me those two semesters and, and that's kind of when I realized, you know, Hey, this is a lot more competitive than you think it is. Um, so I kind of went to the Island with this, you know, I've got something to prove, um, which I think only drove me, um, you know, throughout my career into kind of getting where I am today um, because of that. Yes, that's so, yeah. Yeah. I, I just think that's so important what you just said there, that whole you drive yourself because yes. you are looking around and you're like, oh, all these people are really smart. Okay, so I need to do just as well. And to be honest, when I got to the island, 
there was still that stigma. We were all like, oh, we're all in the Caribbean. We obviously didn't get into a U.S. med school. But the flip side of that was there were all these fourth year students who were leaving the island and were like, if you just work hard, you too will have a future. And you have to then look around at all the people who I know, um, who I kept in touch with, who made it. And then I think about people who didn't because I have to believe they didn't have that drive or they had expectations that they were not able to meet themselves, you know, more than the system or other stuff. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Jane, I couldn't agree more. And Shri just really uh, took the, drove the point home. That's so true. And I, I couldn't agree more. You're absolutely right. I mean, you've got to have fire in the belly to succeed. You know, and you need to prove prove something not only to yourself, but to your parents who are taking a chance and sending you to Antigua. Uh, you know, and I, I you know what? I, I know she's laughing, but I've had parents who who've actually asked me to pinpoint on a map where Antigua was because their son wanted to join uh, the school. And, you know, so I, it, it, it's a huge risk. I mean, as a parent, I don't know how I would have handled it, but, you know, I can, I can see how it's scary. And you're committing to a very large sum of money. <laughs> Absolutely. Shri, I could definitely see the struggle coming from Canada, but from, from Miami, it's a two and a half hour direct flight. So there was a, that wasn't quite an issue for me, luckily. <laughs> I honestly no. think my parents didn't get the whole like island thing at first. They're like, okay, so you're going to med school. And then after you get in, they're like, okay, where is this again? Yeah. And you're going, you're going to do... Yeah, you know, they're just so happy you got in and you're like, okay, great. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah, sure my parents asked me where on the map it was, probably every time I came home. Yes. Like, yes. No, okay, so Antigua. It's hard. Where? It's, hard. Exactly. it's so unheard of, you know. It's it's hard. What do you think what do you think was the biggest advantage of your going to a Caribbean school? Three? Uh honestly you learn to become an adult really fast. So I, I mean that in like the nicest way. Many of you I'm sure are self independent, oh, sorry, excuse me, independent, like self-fulfilled people. I was a guy who enjoyed undergrad. I went to classes, I made friends, I had extracurriculars, I partied, I was completely enjoying my undergrad life. And, you know, I thought I was completely independent because I lived two and a half hours from home. But, you know, every couple of months you can go home, you get home cooked food. Your parents are like, oh, they're so happy to see you. Laundry is done. You see your friends back home. <laughs> when you pick up your life and you move to an island, you, one, realize what you are capable of. You learn, two, what you need to become capable of. And three, I think you really form bonds with people who are like-minded. Um, and not, because everyone wants to be a doctor, that doesn't mean you share the same interests. But I think that you gravitate towards people who are motivated and interested in the same things you are. And I, I think that probably helps when you transition into clinicals, where you are not necessarily with your friends, but you're in a hospital. You have to realize quickly what the dynamic of that hospital is. Who are the people you are working with? Not that everyone's going to be your friend, but you have to learn something from people. Um, and those are all skills that you learn by literally picking your life up, going somewhere new, and starting from scratch. Jane? Um, I think one of like the benefits of going to a Caribbean school for me was just being able to focus. Um, there were, you know, you were going to this island and you really don't have the distractions that you have, say, back in the U.S. So, you know, I was just like Shri. I had a good time in college. I was in a sorority. We did tons of kind of activities and stuff. So it took up a lot of time. And then all of a sudden, I found myself on this island, um, you know, and there were things to do, but I had a focus, you know, and the things around didn't really appeal to me as much. And so I thought it was exactly what I needed um, to, you know, succeed um, without those kind of um, outlying distractions. You know, oh. um, at that time, like, you know, I didn't even carry like a cell phone. I would leave my cell phone at my house all the time and people would be like, where are you? Because I didn't, I really just focused with school and back, school and back. 
pretty much same here. Um, you know, you're, you're there for a reason and that's to study right. and to become a doctor. But at the same time, it's like it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually live abroad, to live on an island. You know, it's just it's something I would never change. I would never go back on. It was just such a, an unbelievable experience. It definitely requires, you know, a lot of motivation and dedication, uh, independence, like Sri was saying. But at the end of the day, it's just overall, I you know, I wouldn't change a thing. And I'm happy that I took the journey, basically. So, so from listening to all three of you, I don't think there were any disadvantages other than missing home, of course. But there weren't any disadvantages of being on the island or, you know, being in a university away from mainland. I think um, something that has changed, uh, I think me and Jane were, let's say, on the island at similar times. Um, the campus has obviously grown. There is new high tech things. Um, so I think any of those quote unquote disadvantages you might have faced if you went to the island at the time that we did don't exist. Like Chase, I'm pretty sure, were you on the new campus? Yes, I was. Yeah. And so by that time, like it's amazing to look at the pictures and see all the facilities that AUA has now because yes. I don't have any of those. And so that might have been a quote unquote disadvantage. But by the time you come back to clinicals, I felt like I was on the same footing as any of my US colleagues right. who I rotated with. And now with like the Sim Center and the library and the gym and the, you know, all these things, I don't know, honestly, that I could say, oh, there's a huge disadvantage other than missing your friends and family. Case? I couldn't agree more, yeah. I mean, you know, when I was there, it was a brand new campus, absolutely beautiful, like very fast Wi-Fi. The only, you know, the only things that you have to get used to kind of are, you know, maybe there's a pothole in the road here and there. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> the, never change. maybe the internet cuts out every once in a while when you're, if you're living off campus, maybe you have a herd of cattle or goats running by the, the road when you're driving. But other than that, no, absolutely no disadvantage. I think the teaching is phenomenal. The sim lab was absolutely great. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very nice, heavily populated island that has everything you could imagine. So there, I, I didn't really see any disadvantages per se. Jane, your perspective as a woman. Um, of the island or of the school? Of generally being, you know, the disadvantage of going to, to Antigua and studying yeah. at the university. Yeah. Are there any disadvantages at all? You know, I always thought, um, like kind of going through the process of residency followed by fellowship, I always kind of thought this would kind of always give me a slight disadvantage um, when it came to jobs and when it came to matching for fellowship and kind of all these things. Um, but it hasn't held me back at all, um, you know, and I don't think it's ever really, you know, I've gone to all my places that I've wanted to um, without any kind of disadvantage that I've really felt. Um, I'm currently like working um, in Houston and it's the world's largest medical center. So when I started here, you know, I thought I am going to feel very out of place, you know, in oh syndrome is kind of a little bit more in your head than it is in real life. Um, but, you know, you see tons of like, you know, uh, doctors that are U.S. med school bred and, you know, you're doing the exact same things that they are doing. And, you know, sometimes you're doing better. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's a little and, and you have better stories, you know. Um, oh. You, I lived on a, isle, a beautiful island for two years. I got to do rotations in New York City, um, you know, I like where they've been kind of in the same place doing kind of the same stuff in the same centers. So I think it really gives you more of like a wide, you know, global approach than kind of being in one place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think the diversity that you all had on campus. Uh, it helps you to better integrate into one of your residency hospitals or to your fellowships. You know, it doesn't phase you. Oh my God, I don't know how to deal with these people. I've never interacted with people like this. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's scary. And, you know, I, I, I can see that from 
you know, people we talk to sometimes, they look at you and they're like, they don't quite know where to slot you. You know, where do, where, how do I react sort of a thing? So I think the experience of having such a diverse faculty and colleagues passing out with you definitely was an advantage for the, uh, you know, all of you coming out. Like, like, look at Tree, he's in Colorado. I mean, who would have thought? Right, Tree? Who would have thought you were in Colorado? Yeah, I didn't think so. But I love it. I love it out here. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. Um, so now I'm going to put you in a spot, Tree. I want you to tell me one very rewarding moment um, of your time with AUA. Just one. <laughs> That's one. No, I, I think uh, one of the best, most rewarding things was figuring out what I wanted to do. I, I still remember. So um, once you're done your clinical sciences on, or excuse me, your basic sciences on the island, you move on to clinical sciences. So you finish step one uh, and then you start to rotate. And so there are core rotations and then there are electives. And so these are the same as US schools. So the core rotations are family medicine, internal medicine, surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, and psychiatry, just to give you the fundamentals. Um, and I still remember my first rotation, it was OB, um, and I had no expectations. I thought it was going to be really boring. I just needed to get through the six weeks and be done. And my second day, I scrubbed into a hysterectomy, uh, which is a removal of the uterus, and that's where I knew I was going to be in the OR. And I didn't know what type of surgeon I was going to be, but I knew that I wanted to do surgery. And the funniest things happen when you least expect them. And I remember at the end of my OB rotation, loving it. It is one of the only reasons that people go to the hospital for a happy reason. You know, all these people are just so excited. And yet, there was so much uh, like there was such a dynamic feel on labor and delivery or when you went to the operating room or when I scrubbed in on gynecologic oncology cases, you know, and, and at the end of the day, I, I love general surgery more. But I remember that feeling of going home on a day where I expected just to go through the motions and realizing that I would figured out what I wanted to do in some way. And that was really exciting. Dave? Um, I would say there's many, you know, probably every board exam, every test <laughs> was probably <laughs> very rewarding. Um, graduation, you know, I can't believe I did that. Uh, <laughs> very rewarding. Um, but a specific one, probably the first time I actually thought, hey, I might become a doctor was I was in my fourth year and I had just finished an endocrinology rotation. And so in endocrinology, you know, they're always palpating the thyroid. Um, and it's just kind of standard in every patient. And so I'd finished that rotation, you know, it was done with, and I went to nephrology. And, um, you know, like med students, you kind of get used to something and you just kind of do the same thing over. So it was a ne nephrol, a kidney patient. Um, and so there wasn't any really re reason to palpate the thyroid. But I did anyway, because I'm, <laughs> um, and I did, and I palpated a mass on his uh, thyroid. And I brought it up to the nephrologist, and he was like, oh, no, you know, and he palpated, and he could feel it also. Um, and uh, he went on to get an ultrasound and biopsy, and he ended up having papillary thyroid cancer. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, and it was such a, you know, obviously, we never wish that on someone, but I remember thinking like, wow, I found that, you know, and I was just a medical student. I thought it was, it was something where it became like very real that like, sure. you know, make diagnoses for, sure. for real people. That's similar, scary. Similar, <laughs> similar thing happened to me. You know, basically because of the uh, the Harvey Sim Lab at AUA, Shri, I don't think you were fortunate enough to uh, experience that. <laughs> but you know, it you know it's a full blown mannequin that has it can reproduce any kind of heart murmur you could imagine. So you know, we got really good at listening, palpating the heart, auscultation, everything. And I'll never forget my you know my first rotation as a clinical med student. This you know an older gentleman, he had the 
classic aortic stenosis uh, murmur. And it was, you know, it had gone completely undiagnosed for probably a long time, but I was like, wait, I'm pretty sure this is a aortic stenosis. Told my attending and sure enough, he's like, yeah, this, he definitely has aortic stenosis. And uh, it happened to be pretty significant. Um, so yeah, just like Jane was saying, it was, it was crazy to put the knowledge of what you learn while you're on the island into clinical practice, you know, once you get back to the States. Um, and I know just you asked what some of the most memorable things, um, not, not to take away from, you know, the high quality board prep and review and everything, but one of my highlights was definitely, you know, you do, once you pass your tests and you have a little time off, you can go to, you're in the Caribbean, you're in a honeymoon destination. So I would, I would, you know, take a, a weekend off and go to, you know, the sandals and some of these different beautiful beach resorts that people are there on their honeymoons. And you're just like, wow, I, I live here. And I live, <laughs> people just couldn't, couldn't believe it. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I could say a lot more, but I'll stop. That's, that's definitely a plus point, you know, you have a meltdown, you go sit on the beach, suddenly everything is in perspective. Uh, you know, definitely, yes. Um, I think our island is probably one of the prettiest I've seen. I've been to a couple of them, but I think ours is definitely one of the prettiest. And I remember the very first time I went, and I don't know if any of you remember Dr. Patan, who used to be in the library. He was director of library. Yeah. Uh, and he actually took me under his wing and he said, I'm going to show you Antigua. And so I said, okay. And he said, we have 365 beaches. And I said, Ramesh, you don't have 365 beaches. Antigua is not big enough to have 365 beaches. And he took me up on that and he drove around 365 beaches. And made me come. I'll never forget that. But I was stunned at some of the beauty of the beaches. I mean, they were really, really, you know, it's... Absolutely. One other, one other thing I wanted to say, too, was uh, like Sri was saying, when it did come to clinical rotations and even internship, I felt like the training I received, you know, I was either equal or above right. uh, my fellow U.S. med student colleagues, just because I think, you know, we, we received such good training. We had that extra motivation that it, it really showed once you got to clinicals and even throughout your internship and residency. So that was very important. And I think as a side note, um, just at least surgical internship, like it, the goal was to be equal, like just to be on the same playing field. You know, I wasn't trying to be a rock star. I was trying to make sure I knew what I was doing. And it felt good to say that I did, um, right. you know, and that is honestly, at the end of the day, just kind of circling back to the whole point of this, I think we are all people who applied ourselves we're clearly doing well and, and that shows because we're able to talk about our stories um but we all started as interns we all started running around a hospital with our like heads cut off being like oh my god i don't know where x y and z is i don't know how to take care of this person but you get there that's at the end of the day you end up being where you want to be I think so too. And I think we have a very active audience. I have a question for Chase. How much downtime did you have to enjoy the area? When it came to Antigua? Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I do want to stress the fact that you are, you're there for a reason. So it's yes. not like you have unlimited time to, to fully explore the island. Um, you know, I did, you know, you put in you have to be ready to study a lot. And I'm talking anywhere between five, six, eight hours a day, maybe more on some weekends if you have a, a big exam coming up. But what I was referring to more so is like, yeah, when you, you have your exam on a Thursday or Friday, and then that weekend, you know, you can go out and explore the island and actually enjoy yourself, rent four wheelers, jet skis, catamaran, any, go scuba diving you know I did so many different things that I you know had never done before in my life because of being there in Antigua right. and 
it was just it's such a safe island which is a, a big plus obviously um but yeah no it just it was it was awesome to actually be able to enjoy it once you were done putting in the hard work studying for your exams Yes, and like I guess with any other program, it's always good to have the work balance right. You do need downtime. You do need, you know, just just space and to do whatever. You know, of course, I mean, Chase was very athletic. He went ski diving and whatever. I could just, okay, that's not we're not going down that path. Okay. <laughs> so the other question I have, and Jane, I think you spoke briefly about this: is have you ever felt like you needed to justify your choice? to go to a Caribbean school? Um, I think I've felt that probably more in my head than I actually needed to. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, um, the name is there, but you become, you know, your own, you are the doctor. Um, and and what they see in your skills and your um, clinical work is far greater than kind of the name of where your what school you went to. You know, your grades are important. Um, your letters of recommendation are extremely important when it comes to you know fellowship. And as you know, if you want to specialize, the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller right. when you go into specialties. You know. You think you may not know some, you might be applying to a program and you think no one knows you there, but likelihood is they've heard about you. They've talked to your program director. They've talked to, you know, multiple people that can vouch for you. So I think at the end, you know, once you kind of get into residency, I think it just kind of becomes more of the name. Um, but everything else is kind of all on you and how you practice. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chase, this is coming back to you, and I think they're asking, what do you mean regarding AUA looks at students holistically? Um, mainly what I went, meant by that was that, you know, yes, the, the MCAT must be taken, but at the end of the day, I know that's not the only factor that AUA takes into consideration when considering, ad, you know, administering a applicant um, they look at your overall application like what you've done as far as research community service work experience life experience etc uh, for instance my med school roommate was an emt and had wow. you know, just incredible experience and that translated into him being an, a phenomenal doctor who's now practicing internal medicine up in uh, cincinnati so wow. Um, that's, you know, just, just because you may not do well on MCAT doesn't mean you're not qualified to be a great doctor, because if you have the drive and the motivation, you can definitely get there. And AUA provides the foundation. Yes, it, you know, a lot falls on you to, to be self-motivated and disciplined and get your board scores and do all that. But at the end of the day, AUA you know, provides you what you need. So that's all that matters. Do you think, um, and probably Shri can speak to this, do you think uh, you were at a disadvantage during clinicals um, that you came from the Caribbean, from an American University of Antigua, as against the U.S. students? Uh, so things have changed, again, in all honesty. Um, the number of hospitals I had to rotate at uh, in 2009, eight, nine was a lot less. And so uh, as a matter of fact, when you were offered a rotation, you said, yes, it didn't matter where you were moving or who you had to work with. You just did it. Uh, I think that for surgery, um, there was a slight disadvantage in the sense that there weren't a lot of programs that AUA offered at that time where you worked with residents. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to Staten Island where we worked with SUNY downstate residents and they really cultivated my interest in surgery after I told them I was interested. Uh, and I think that um, one thing, you know, Jane sort of brought up is you're not just the med student, right? You are the first set of hands on someone and sometimes the only set of hands on someone when you go talk to your attending and say, oh, oh, I found this or, 
you know, the resident, you know, they're very busy. And so yeah. you are the first set of eyes um, on any patient. And I tell my med students that now that they're not just the med student, you know, if they find something, they're supposed to say something. Uh, and so in terms of disadvantage, there were a lot less sites, but I don't think that's an issue anymore. There's, I think AU has right. what, 40 something, 50 something hospitals that yeah. works for across the US and Canada, which is huge. Um, yes. To be able to do a rotation back home would have been fantastic too. We've also just signed up uh, hospitals in the UK, as well as the ones we have in India. So we're just going a little bit international now because our, we find our student bodies from all over the world. So, you know, we want to be able to tell them, just like how you said, go back home and do your rotations. You know, be close to family and do your rotations. So, you know, it's it's working out well. You're absolutely right. Yeah. The question, but I think the question was coming from the audience, but the question I think they were asking was, did you ever feel while you were doing grand rounds or when you were doing whatever with your attending, did you ever feel that you were um, at a disadvantage because you came from a Caribbean school, not a U.S. med school? Uh, no. Um, and to be honest, the reason is I think when you are in that position and you're with a whole bunch of med students, not many attendings really know what school you're from and you're uh. lucky if they know your name. So the only thing that matters then is the knowledge that you have. If you don't have it, it doesn't matter if you're from Harvard, it doesn't matter if you're from India, Africa, AUA, they'll just look at you and say, you need to read more. <laughs> so yeah. to be honest, they don't like I don't think doctors or residents even in that at that point really care where you went to school. Um, do you feel like you have to justify your decision? Sure, there are always going to be people who are going to ask you, but if you're happy and you're confident, that'll come off. Um, and if you haven't read, that will come off too. So that's really <laughs> all they care about at that point in time. So Jane, where you are in Texas, I know we have a lot of alumni in Texas. Do you have any of our students with you who are your juniors maybe or? Um, yeah, so there's a couple um, AUA um, residents actually. Um, one is doing neurology at my program and then one is doing psychiatry. Um, so it was really nice to kind of bump into them and that, that kind of just came up in conversation. That's um, great. I mean, we're still hoping to get rotations in Texas. Let's see one day in the future. Because yeah, that would be so, awesome for our students to come to you for a clinical rotation. Yeah, uh, that would, you know, that would yeah. be really awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I know you went to FIU for your rotations, but you weren't on the global health track, right? No, unfortunately, the global health track started just after I graduated. Started up. So the FIU rotations, I know, you know, you wanted to be in Florida and you were happy to do all your rotations in one, uh, one spot. Do you think there's any disadvantage to that? I would say absolutely not. I mean, okay. there's benefits to both for sure. Um, like some of these people were mentioning earlier, like the opportunity to go to New York or go do rotations, you know, just to get a different perspective throughout the country is amazing. But at the same time, uh, knowing I wanted to stay in Florida, it really worked to my advantage because, um, you know, through clinical rotations, I met many of my mentors to this day, including, you know, Dr. Reese and sure. uh, Dr. Ray, who actually did his, he's a radiologist in Miami. He, he did his residency at Mount Sinai, which is where I am as well. So, I mean, you just meet so many people right. and, and it also helped that my wife had just moved to Miami and, you know, we were looking to start a family, but, uh, no, I don't think, I mean, there's pros and cons to, to both. Um, but mainly I speak to the pros. If you know, you want to be in a place, but even if you don't want to stay in Florida, I would, you know, I interviewed for residency for fellowship at places outside of Florida. And they were still interested to hear about like, oh, so what is this uh, AUA, FIU affiliation? Right. And, you know, so then we got to talking. It was a great talking piece. Um, so, no, they absolutely loved it. And I think it, you know, it couldn't have been any better. That's great. I mean, the AIU, AIU, oh my God. AUA, FIU affiliation is something uh, 
people are fascinated about and we're really the only Caribbean school who's got uh, got this going, you know, and it's, it, it's awesome. It's really awesome. And I've not yet come across anybody who did either the global health track or just the rotations at FIU, even if they didn't want to stay in Florida, uh, who've said, oh my God, I wish I'd come to New York or I wish I'd gone to California. Uh, I've not met anyone who said that. And that itself speaks about the program that Absolutely. we offer with, with the FIU. Had an so, overall amazing experience, yeah. I, I, I'm told, I'm, I still haven't been to the campus. I, I'm looking forward to going and just walking around and, you know, meeting all the people I speak to on the phone and, you know, don't get a chance to go visit. So, Jane, let me ask you, uh, what is the one piece of advice um, you wish you had been given before you started med school? Um... I think the one piece of advice would be just to remember that everything will work out. Um, you know, I think I spent a lot of time after every test kind of being like, am I going to make it through this? Am I going to pass this exam? Am I going to, you know, kind of a little bit of self-doubt probably in just feeling like you're coming from a Caribbean med school. Like I have sure. to, I have to, you know, do amazing at my step scores I, am i even going to do am i going to do all this am i even going to match um but you know i look around and i look at all the friends that i kind of um uh like joined together with from the island and you know we're all working we're all in like really good places um and you know none of us you know kind of uh, fell astray. I think we all worked really hard and got to where we needed. And I think some of that extra worry, which comes, uh, you know, comes with just the situation, uh, will be there, but, you know, just take it easy. It will, you will make it as long as you put in the work. Chase, what about you? Do, do you wish you'd been told how hard it is? Uh, I mean, I kind of knew it going into it. It can't be easy to become a doctor because everyone would do it, but uh, <laughs> it, it took serious self-motivation and dedication, you know, lifelong learning. You know, we're still, even as doctors now today, continuing education. It just never ends. Um, but the main thing is, at the end of the day, it's on you as the med student to realize how hard you have to work be very self-disciplined and motivated. And like Jane said, if you put in the work, put in the time, you can uh, definitely accomplish your goals of being a doctor. And Shree, for you, it must have been a little bit different. I mean, you were crossing two countries. You left Canada, you came to America, and then went to Antigua. Uh, do you wish that you had been told, listen, this, this path you've chosen is going to be really, really tough? I think you'd be kidding yourself, sort of what the other guys said, if you didn't think it was going to be tough. Um, I wish someone had told me, it's okay to feel lost sometimes. Like, it's okay to feel right. like you don't know what you're doing. Right. Um, there is so much pressure and stress that comes with the title and the, like you said, your parents and your family and the fact that you're moving. But... I, I really wish someone had just said, sometimes it's okay to take a day or two for yourself. And I too, I enjoyed the island, but it was only after exams or when everyone else was going out, I was like, okay, I'm going to go out. But I, I think the most important thing that I've come to realize and I'm still working on is a little bit of wellness goes a long way. So taking the 20 minutes out and working out in the morning, like, do I wish I'd run on the beach more? Yeah, absolutely. Do I wish I'd, you know, gone to that, I don't know, extra event. Yes, absolutely. And, and I have no regrets about where I am. But looking back, that is the advice I would have given to myself. Like, take some time for yourself because this isn't easy and it's not getting easier. So you might as well make the most of your opportunities to enjoy yourself and take some R&R &R when you can. That's And that's true, I'm sure, with all three of you, even in your present positions, uh, you know, the stress levels and, you know, your schedules. You know, Absolutely. get take a break. You know, you know, walk your dog, chase, and you know, <laughs> stuff like that. It's it, it's really different. 
do you think that, you know, this is just off the top of my head, but do you think that the clinical experiences that the US medical students have and what you were getting from the AUA affiliate hospitals was any different? Chase, you're shaking your head. Definitely not. I mean, when it came to clinicals, I was rotating side by side with, uh, you know, US med students, particularly, you know, throughout the FIU system. And no, I think if anything, you know, we, you were, we were just, I was up to par, if not exceeding expectations when it came to, you know, when you compare yourself to the other med students. Okay. And kind of like Sri was saying, you know, I'm not trying to strive to be some kind of gunner or rock star, but at the same time, you want to, you know, you want to perform well and you want to be right. the best that you can be and you want to read and make sure you're up to date with everything and you're just, your clinical knowledge is there and you're, you're sharp on, on clinical rounds. So I felt no disadvantage, if anything, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little bit better. Okay. And Sri, in your present position now, do you think there was a difference? Uh, no, but again, so much has changed. So I think now AUA, when you are in rotations, they're able to provide you with where you're going, what to expect. Yes. Um, you know, the only disadvantage that when I was going through it was you didn't know if there was a continuous, like you would get through your third year without a break. And I was lucky, I did. Um, and I think that was the only thing because again, right. they were acquired, you guys were acquiring hospital relations. Yes. Um, now looking back, it didn't make a difference. And I was happy to move, you know, one, one weekend I like left Chicago, drove to New York. I drove from New York to Denver. I, you know, and, and so like you make the most of really learning about America and again, being Canadian, I was happy to explore and just have a great time. Um, but that would be the only thing my American compatriots were definitely like oh yeah i end on a friday start this on a monday i end that on a friday and i start on a monday and so when you have a slight uh you know uh, mind meltdown when you're like wait a second wait what am i doing that next friday do i have a place to go like you really again but that speaks to being self-motivated to call your coordinator be like okay do you have anything what's going on, and then you build a relationship that way too, so. Yes, absolutely right. Jane, what about, uh, what about in Texas? Do you think there is, a, there is any sort of difference or disparity because you came from a Caribbean school and there are US med, especially University of Texas uh, students around? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think so, um, at least from my experience and, you know, working with the other doctors, I haven't really felt that disparity at all. Um, you know, um, I think, you know, in terms of like being able to practice here, it wasn't bad at all. Um, but I had the advantage of, um, I was board certified in pediatrics from Florida. Um, and so it's easy, to, easier, uh, much easier to um, get your Texas license if you're already board certified Ah, okay. Um, for another reason, um, whereas it might be harder um, coming from AUA, you know, straight out of residency, trying to get your license. Right, right, right. Um, so if you do a fellowship, you know, it's a great place to come back after because, you know, uh, you probably have board certification from prior. Right. So we we like to think that, you know, we that students come to us because they hear all of you and they see the success stories and they want to be as successful as all of you are, uh, you know, and look up to you guys and mentor. And I know many of you talk to grads and talk to current students. Um, and, you know, I know Sri is very active with the, uh, with the clubs. And uh, do you think, do you think that by saying students who want to go to a med school don't get into a U.S. or Canadian school should definitely look at a Caribbean school? I think you have to really take a second and figure out what's important to you. Um, you know, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, so I didn't care where that meant going. But be honest with yourself. If being close to home means that you will succeed, like you are someone who needs your network, needs 
your parents and your friends or your dog. Right. right. That's okay. Like, be honest with yourself. Because the last thing you want to do is take this large plunge and then realize you're in over your head. I, I think, you know... I, me and my wife, we talk about this. My wife, let's let's be okay. She went to Ross, you know, it's okay. <laughs> um, and she, uh, you know, but we talk about it all the time. Like, thank God we were people who were able to make connections and find you uh, a, a family because otherwise it would have been really hard. And so I think it's not about wanting to be a doctor, but it's about what you're going to do to succeed to become a doctor. And it, it's no joke, like, you know, Jane was willing to go to India to do it. You know, I don't know that I would have gone to India. I'm being completely honest. I have tons of family there, but that wasn't something I was willing to go. Like Antigua, okay. India, not so much. And so just being honest, you know, about, the, you know, what you want to do. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I mean, obviously this is a choice we like to give the students, prospective students who are coming in, right? saying that, look, we are, we are equal, if not better, than some of the U.S. schools. And uh, except for the fact that your diploma is from a U.S. school, there's really nothing uh, different about what we are giving you. We're probably going to give you more. We have the Education Enhancement Department. Uh, we have all of us holding your hand. And anyway, fortunately, even though we are big, do you know we actually have over 3,000 alumni? I oh, was wow. like, oh, my goodness, do we really? And so, I mean, it was phenomenal, but we're still family, you know, and we, we still, I mean, I, I like to, I like to tell the newbies who come into the company that we still know our students by name and we know what went on and we know stories about our students. And, you know, you ask me about a student and I'll tell you whether he's a good fit or not. And, you know, I think that makes us different to a large U.S. school where you have 300 students sitting down to listen to a lecture. You know, we're different. We have small class sizes. Uh, you know, we, we, have, we have so much of almost personal interaction with the faculty. And the Education Enhancement Department does a phenomenal job of making sure that you succeed, you do your steps properly, you're well prepared. And, you know, hats off to them. I don't know I don't know how they have the patience to do this, but, you know, it, it's really great. It's just, you know, I, I sometimes, like, Jane, you tell me, you, I mean, you know India pretty well, you've got family there. Students coming from India, they come with a very different mindset. But do you think that's a disadvantage for them to come to the Caribbean? Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, it's kind of like a melting pot. Um, in Antigua. It's everybody, you know, everyone is treated the same. Everyone kind of gets the same education and, you know, it's all, you know, just take advantage of your opportunities. Um, but just to go off that, you know, just to give a shout out to the Educational Enhancement Department, um, I thought one of my biggest um, things that I loved about AUA is when I went, um, you know, they were kind of starting like the TA programs and they right. started the small group facil um, facilitator groups um, and that was probably one of my biggest advantages because I would take a class you know and you do well in the class and so the next semester you could become a TA for that class so I would TA the class but I'd move on you know you take new classes and so I did that kind of all through the first two years of basic science and I also did got opportunities to be a small group facilitator and that benefit was that, you know, all this information builds on top of each other. So being right. TA and being able to do the small group facilitators, you were keeping everything really fresh. Right. By your time. So when it came time for a step, you know, it definitely took a little bit, a little bit uh, off of that um, kind of stress of having to go back to, you know, anatomy 101. Um, because everything was kind of, you know, reinforced in your head throughout the two years. Um, and, you know, I don't think I would have had that opportunity in another school. Ace? I mean, that was very well said by Jane there. Uh, totally agree with everything she said. Um, yeah, don't have much to add except for the fact that, yeah, I did also participate, you know, 
after the fact as a, a TA, uh, which basically, you know, it helped kind of continue your education and prepare you for the steps that you were going to take. Um, so I thought it was very beneficial. Three? Uh, yeah, I was a TA for multiple classes. We didn't have small groups um, back then, but, uh, you know, it was cool to feel like you could, one, really know the material, and then two, help other people, um, because your fellow students will feel much more comfortable asking you than they will any professor. Um, mm -hmm. And we all talked about this. There's this fear of failure, this feel of uh, fear of appearing quote unquote stupid because you don't know something. Um, and I think that being able to ask a fellow student made that much more of a difference. Like I remember I, my TA, I think she's a hematology oncology um, attending somewhere right now. Um, and I keep in touch through social media, but that's where I built that relationship, you know, because she yeah. explained some advanced biochemistry to me one time. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to your TA sessions. You really know what you're talking about. This is great. <laughs> I agree. So as we wind down, okay, we, we've still got a couple of minutes. Uh, I didn't want um, Andrea not to knock us off, you know, so, uh, you know, we have a couple of minutes. So as we wind down, what would be the one piece of advice other than you need to work really hard that you would give prospective students and parents who are now listening to us tonight? Jane, do you want to start? I would, I would probably say my one piece of advice would be to, you know, really make sure this is where your heart is and this is exactly what you want. Um, and, you know, if it's because you want to help people, there are so many, you know, um, really commendable professions that help people, you know, teachers, social workers, firefighters, you know, the list goes on. Um, but, you know, becoming a physician, it is a long road, um, you know, and there are there are bumps in the road. And I think one of the things you have to be prepared for is while this process is long, you might see that friends that chose other professions will move on with their life a little bit faster, um, you know, and you will feel a little behind, um, but it's okay because it ends up being worth it at the end. This is truly what you want to do. Um, but if it's not, you know, that is going to take a big toll. Um, but that would probably be my best advice. Three? Uh, I think that was very well said. I think if art's not in it, you're not going to be able to succeed. I, I think that was fantastic. Um, I think uh, the one piece of advice I would give, and uh, this is uh, something I saw on Twitter, uh, but today there was an international medical graduate uh, who showed up on my Twitter feed who said, we need to normalize stopping the stigmata against IMGs. And I think that if I were to give any of you any advice, it would be believe in your choice. So don't go in thinking that this is your second choice or that you had to go somewhere because right. you didn't have to do anything, you know, but be your own advocate, like fight for every opportunity because you deserve it. And if you got in, it's because you deserve to be there, not because someone you know took pity on you or reviewed your uh application and skipped over your mcat score just like you there are thousands of other people who are trying to prove that they deserve to be there and the truth is you all do but make sure that it's really for yourself and then be your be your own advocate because at the end of the day the only person who you're accountable to is yourself true true Chase. Couldn't agree more. Well said. Um, again, just to reemphasize, you know, doubting yourself is completely normal. I would just recommend using it as additional motivation, you know, to get you through the process. Um, it's totally worth the long journey that it takes to get to becoming a doctor. Um, and ultimately, you know, if that's what you have in your heart to be a physician, then do what you have to do and see your dream come to fruition, essentially. Absolutely. So it looks like we have a lot of people sending in a lot of questions. So I'm just going to go through a couple 
because otherwise we're going to be here all night answering questions. Um, what was the hardest part of joining a Caribbean medical school? I know we spoke about leaving home and, uh, you know, going to probably an island your parents had never heard of. But other than that, do you think there was anything that was really hard about going to a Caribbean medical school? Any one of you? Other than the, the sheer fact of, you know, packing up and moving to another country, an island, essentially, uh, which personally, I got used to really quickly. But I mean, that's the only thing. Other than that, no, I would say no other major disadvantages I could think of. Three? <laughs> Tropical storms and earthquakes. <laughs> They're very real. Where you see that in know. Florida, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, see, not <laughs> that's so why, much. That's why he's sitting in Colorado, right? <laughs> um, I think that's a very real thing. Just something to be think thoughtful okay. about. Actually, day one, when I arrived to Antigua, it was actually a tropical storm. <laughs> and the, oh, Lord. The power went out for like, you know, 12 hours, and I was like, okay, all right, this is how uh, med school's going to be. But no. Do, it, it turned out much better than that. Do either of you know Dr. Doug Dixon? He's one of our alumni. No. So he, uh, and this is something he has told me himself. He, um, he was a nurse and an EMT and then decided to go to med school. So he's one of our, you know, older students. But he arrived in uh, Antigua and like you, I think the second day or the third day, they got hit with a really bad storm. I mean, the, uh, the the housing was flooded and the classes were flooded and all sorts of things. And he said he had like this, this moment when he decided that he was going to become a helicopter doctor, doctor a helicopter medic. And here he is. I mean, he's, he's now running this phenomenal program and he, he's doing phenomenally well, but he lives his life in a helicopter. But uh, he, he told me, he says, that was, that was the moment I said, no. I can't be like this. I have to be able to rescue people when it's a storm. So, you know, it, it's a deja vu moment, like Tree said, you know. But Tree, you haven't been to India for the storms. That's why you're saying that. <laughs> no, that's not true. I've been there during monsoon season. I'm, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just saying, if we're being I honest, know. we should warn all these people that there is some tropical, interesting things that oh, you're going oh. to encounter. <laughs> Jane, what do you think? Um, I think, you know, maybe some of the disadvantages um, Shri kind of mentioned before, which I think have changed over the years, you know, this was kind of a while back when I was there was um, the rotations weren't always guaranteed back to back. And, right. and, and that was, you know, a little bit of a, a stress, which for the most part, you know, um, if you if you were able to stay on the phone long enough, you know, you could get those back to back. And I did have that advantage. Um, but, you know, I think it was helpful. Um, the other thing was maybe, uh, you know, if you're someone that doesn't like to move around, you know, then you would have seen that as kind of maybe a little bit frustrating, but right. that love to move around. Um, and so, you know, I kind of loved being able to go to different um, places and cities. And so I kind of took advantage of a uh, disadvantage. Okay. Okay. So the other question that has come in is, did you feel pressure to get higher scores on your step one than your U.S. friends? Jane? A hundred percent. I definitely, you know, yeah. <laughs> when, when they were studying, I was probably <laughs> studying double. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, I know. I've, I mean, I've talked to students who are preparing for step one who are having an absolute meltdown. And, you know, calling me and say, I don't know why I got into this and, you know, I can't do this and I'm never going to get a 240 and I don't know what I'm going to do and, you know, all the rest of it. Yes, the pressure is genuine. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's there. Um, the last question that is coming is, can you speak to AUA curriculum? How helpful was it? Uh, Jane, do you want to start? I know all three of you went through different phases of AUA. So let's start with you. Yeah. Um, well, 
I thought the curriculum was great. You know, I thought um, everything kind of built up on each other. Um, and like I said, because I was able to TA and do the small groups, um, it's one of those things where, you know, in college you go through all these classes and some things you may never see again. Right. Um, in med school, no matter what, all of that stuff somewhere pops up somewhere in some shape or form. Right. Whether it's on your step one, your step two, you know, this random biochemical enzyme that you completely forgot might pop up on your step <laughs> Um and so, you know, I think it was helpful to like kind of have everything kind of reiterate itself throughout the classes. So you could really mesh everything together. Oh. Um, so it became kind of, you know, the body as a system, um, although you learned it in individual kind of um, subjects. Three. Uh, I think the curriculum was fine. I honestly thought when it came time to study for step one um, or even step two, like Jane said, I was able to draw on things from my classes. Um, I thought the professors, uh, there was one professor, I, I don't think he's any longer with the school, but he was our path two professor. His name was Dr. Krishna. And yes, for the he retired. First time in a class, I felt like I understood how a body worked and he was the pathology teacher. And so from him, I learned how I, I learned how anatomy mixed with physiology mixed with cell bio. And he just did such a beautiful job of making you interested in the things that you were going to treat. Um, and I think just when speaking to the curriculum that yes, there is a certain level of self-motivation you need to get through the material. Uh, and that does involve going to class. Uh, I was not a class goer for the first two semesters and then I realized how important class was and so I got on board. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the truth is that the curriculum is there and it has everything outlined from day one what you need to know. And so there's no question marks. You either know it or you don't. And that right. comes down to the individual person. Chase. Definitely agree with that. Um, the curriculum is there for sure. Uh, the professors were great. Um, in addition to that, it's good to supplement with, you know, your, your USMLE first aid, step one, step two books, in addition to like question banks, of course. Um, that was, I found that very helpful to like, you know, incorporate it early on, not totally rely on it, but kind of just supplement your, your AUA's curriculum. Um, and then Additionally, this the the move that AUA has made to like you know smaller groups, smaller lectures. I think that's amazing. I think I was somewhere in between when they when they were making the transition. So you know, I I still had some you know big lectures, but now I know it, a strong emphasis is on small groups, small learning, very you know small ratio of students to professors, which that's going to go a long way. So that's that's great. Fantastic. So I think we need to start winding down. Is there anything you all want to share that I've not covered? Uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you as always. You know, we are very proud of you. We, we just want to hear from you what, what your experiences are like. Is there anything we need to change? Anything we need to do better? You know, just, I, I'm not going to stop um, uh, bothering you all. So don't bring that up because that's not going to change. So don't bring that up. Jane? Um, I mean, I would just say if, if you are someone out there that's contemplating, you know, this and you're not sure, um, you know, just uh, take a moment and really, really examine what your goals are and what you really want to do. Remember that, you know, this profession is one where um, you're going to be with people on the best days of their life, but also the worst days of their life. Um, and that comes with a variety of emotions, um, for both them. And, you know, that can also be kind of forecasted on yourself, uh, on some of those days. And, um, you know, if, if you feel like this is where you're supposed to be, go for it. You know, we're cheering you on. We made it. Um, and, uh, you can too. Uh, I was just gonna just piggyback off that like yeah 
you you can make it. You know, if this is really what you want to do, you can absolutely make it. Uh, but remember, success isn't guaranteed. I think every one of us, while we are happy to talk about our success and what we did, like Jane said, we've all had the worst days and where you question yourself and that's normal. That is totally fine. I, I think one thing the school does do a good job of is connecting you with those people who can tell you, oh, I too have had that same failure, but who among us hasn't had failure? And so just keeping that in mind and remembering that this Caribbean med school, speaking just about AUA, has had people go into every facet of medicine. Yes. Um, and I think that that's fantastic. I don't think that there are other medical schools that can claim the same um, the same success. Uh, and I truthfully am biased, just as Chase said at the beginning, like I'm <laughs> proud of where I went. And I think that the success stories and meeting people, like I, I've never met Chase or Jane, you know, but here we are having a conversation right now. Um, and that's because Par brought us together. Uh, and I think that that speaks volumes. Chase? Couldn't, couldn't agree more with both of what Jane and Shri just said. Um, and one, one other thing that I just wanted to mention is that, yes, you know, the stigma of Caribbean meds schools and med students still exist, but it's fading fast. And that's for a good reason. And I think AUA is a prime example of why that stigma is fading and it's fading fast. So have no doubts. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all again. Thank you, our panelists. And thank you all of you who tuned in. I hope your questions were answered. If not, you can always send an email in and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Be sure to follow us on the social channels and I hope all of you are members of the AUA website and the Facebook. Uh, it's very active. You know, our alumni page is very active. And like I just said, we have over 3,000 alumni. So if you're looking to speak to a specific uh, speciality, a specialist, one of our alumni, uh, definitely you can, be, you can be connected. See you soon. Good night. And thank you again. <laughs>